How many times have you been in, in ICU since uh, this? Because of the lung problem, yeah, yeah. it is countless. Today, I am going to take you back in time. German surgeons who have flown in tried their very best to save my sight. I am taking you back to the place where a bomb in a truck was used on Kenyan soil. I'm taking you to August 7th Memorial Park. 25 years ago, this place was not like this. It was not a park. It was the location of the U.S. Embassy in Nairobi and was basically a small United States on Kenyan soil. But one day, in a matter of seconds, it was all gone. On the morning of 7th August 1998, the streets of Nairobi were abuzz with activity. City dwellers were going to work, businesses and meetings. But unknown to them, Al-Qaeda terrorists Mohammed Sadiq Ode and Mohammed Rashid Oliwale had assembled a bomb in a city hotel and were on their way to the target. The country was facing a cash crunch. Salaries for civil servants had been delayed and bankers were on strike. At around nine that morning, Diana Muticia walked into cooperative bank headquarters on behalf of the government of Kenya. That time there was a strike in the bank. So the staff being away, most of the Salaries for the civil servants had not yet been processed. So it was a Friday morning, and after we received a lot of complaints from our staff, I was assigned because I was in charge of salaries department. I came to check what was happening, and after I done with the Bangladesh Bank in Arambe, I came to National Bank. I sorted out. And my last uh, bank was in a cooperative bank. She was meeting with Abdallah and other bank representatives. And there were other two ladies who were working on the process of the payroll for our ministry. At the same time, then Minister for Trade, JJ Kamodo, was holed up in a meeting with the U.S. ambassador to Kenya at the cooperative bank building. The minister's office was in a high-rise building across from the small parking lot which the U.S. Embassy shared with the members, some of the members of this high-rise building. Um, I was on the 21st floor. We had gone through the photo op that usually begins ministerial kinds of meetings. Douglas Sidialo was driving along Haile Selassie Avenue for work as he approached the very intersection of destiny. An enigmatic altercation unveiled itself before his eyes, etching an indelible image that has endured as the final tabloid in the gallery of his memories till this very day. I saw this truck that took a turn and went towards the American embassy gates. Then I witnessed an altercation between the occupants of this truck and the security personnel from the embassy site. Then I heard what I thought were gunshots, but I was told these were but hand grenades being thrown at the embassy. And what came to mind was that these were but gangsters who wanted to rob the embassy. It never occurred to me that they were actually terrorists. Then I saw a man run from the scene of the shooting with a walkie-talkie on his right hand. And that's when the huge blast went. 
And from that day, I have never witnessed light of day again. I became blind. A bomb had exploded. I was sitting next to the minister on a couch and we heard a boom that sounded to me like a construction boom. And I asked, is there a construction going on? And he, the minister, as well as many of the other people in the room, got up and started walking to the window. I don't know what instinct kept me from getting up, um, but I was the last one up and had taken a few steps when this boom, a uh, huge percussion came and threw me back. We heard a sound, a very bad sound. I thought it was a tire bus. Then from there, I thought it was a commotion. In this building that day, there was strike. I thought maybe it was gunshots. But later is when I heard we, the place became dark. And before I knew it, we were hit by objectives, by objects which are flying from all over. My name is Rachel Siengo. Currently, I'm working for the government of Kenya. I'm a civil servant. On that particular day, uh, I was in Form 2 and I'd gone to my mom's office uh, at Cooperative House, fifth floor. That's where she used to work with the Ministry of Trade. Uh, we were to go to McKinney School for my young brother's uh, prize giving day. So when, I was, when we were just about to leave, she got a phone call in the office landline. Then she told me to have a seat so that she can finish with whomever she was talking to, and then we can proceed. Uh, before she could even finish the phone call, we had, first of all, we had something like gunshots. And then since her office, uh, she was almost at the window, she turned around and she saw some people running. Then for me, what I remember next is just seeing a bright light and I found myself on the floor. A cloud of death engulfed the Kenyan capital city on the intersection of Haile Selassie and Moi Avenues. I thought simultaneously, I'm going to die. There, a truck loaded with 2,000 pounds of highly explosive TNT forced its way to the back entrance of the embassy and was detonated. In less than one minute, the US embassy was shattered demolishing the nearby Ofudi Cop House and gutting the 17-story cooperative bank. At the same time, every cell in my body was in panic mode because I was on the 21st floor. I was waiting for the building to um, collapse and was waiting, uh, uh, literally uh, tensing myself for the fall. It was approximately 30 minutes after 10 in the morning when the coordinated truck bombings happened. The attack at the Nairobi Embassy, which was located in a busy downtown area, caused the greatest devastation and loss of life. The bomb did not discriminate. Over 200 people perished, including 12 Americans. More than 4,500 others were left with serious injuries. Innocent people. Before the bomb, actually before we had the first blast, I was being attended by Mr. Mwilo, Abdallah Musioka Mwilo. Musioka Mwilo. He was a manager in the bank, and he had just come that day to work as a result of shortage of staff mm -hmm. who had gone for a strike. Mm -hmm. Actually, it happened when we were together. We were four of us. They all died. I'm the only one who survived. 
But as I survived, there, we were four of us in, in that, that room, in that, room uh -huh. in that meeting. They all died, Mr. Mwilo and the two other colleagues. They died, I'm the only one. He was working for the cooperative bank, he was a manager. Mm -hmm. I'm the only one who survived. The bomb was intended for the embassy, but the Ufundi Corp building, which housed numerous offices and a secretarial school, absorbed most of the shock. Moments after the Nairobi blast, the scenes were gruesome. It was simply dreadful. Scores of people were cut by flying glass as the blast shattered windows in office buildings five blocks away. It just happened that I was passing by and I would never imagine that by being at such a place at such a time would have a terror attack. For the survivors like Douglas Sidialo and Diana Muticia, the blast was the beginning of a whole new life. Diana had to learn how to live with one lung and numerous metal roads in her body. I survived with a lot of injuries. I, my, I, I had a, a severe uh, back injury, which have so far been, uh, I had four surgeries. The last one in uh, South Africa, where I was fused with screw metals. Mm -hmm. I have 16 metals on my back. 16? 16 metals on my back. And then I also had a lung injury, which has a one, I, I have only one lung, which is functioning. My left side injury does not uh, function so because the lung, of the, the, yes, the left side lung yes, does not work. Does not work because of the chest injuries, which has survived during the bomb blast. In fact, I coughed blood for one year. Every time you cough? Yes, when I was in hospital and even when I was out of the hospital. Even as we talk now, I'm still under my doctor, Dr. Muridi, who is a chest expert. I usually see him periodically and most of the time when I get a small, even just a cold, I, I, I must be admitted in the hospital because I love to use inhaler because I have a very uh, weak chest and I inhaled a lot of uh, that uh, smoke. It affected my, my lungs. The smoke badly. from the bomb? From the bomb. So I love to live with it. I love to cope with it. I love to take medication. On top of the back injuries. It is not very easy because it causes pain. It is just destabilizes me. Even I remember 2021, the year 2021, I had to stay in Aga Khan ICU because of the same problem, of the lung problems. During that was during the COVID. So when, when, when COVID came, how was the situation for you? It was very bad because actually it saw me in the Aga Khan hospital twice. And the third one was almost fatal because I had to stay in the ward for more than four weeks. You talked about being in ICU. How many times have you been in, in ICU since uh, this? Because of the lung problem, yeah, yeah. it is countless. Since that time. But the last one was last year and the 2021. Sidialo had to start acclimatizing to life in darkness. When it dawned upon me that I had lost signs, I was very much devastated. I was very angry, very bitter, and completely enraged. I started imagining in my own heart and mind that if I would meet these men behind that heinous and barbaric act of cowardice, I would have skinned them alive. I would have rattled them, little by little so that they could feel and experience the pain we are going through. I depend on other people to do cause chores for me. I cannot tie on because it needs that I bent. I cannot walk long because I still have a weak limp on myself. I also got uh, nerves problems, which strike like this time when it is cold. 
so it is like uh, I'm sickly all the time apart from the the illness now apart from what I got injuries they think at other other um, other other ailments which I not have including the chest problem but one thing that surprised me as we talked is that despite the struggles they go through, they have learned to love life and the world as it is. Bitterness and anger only but retards healing. So I started picking up the pieces. They say peace is what they want. There is life and we must live because I have a life to live. That is what gave me the courage now. Sidialo doesn't even hate the United States government which despite the U.S.-Sudan compensation deal has overlooked them during the redress of victims. The Kenyan victims have never been, you know, they have completely been discriminated. The Kenyan victims have never received any form of financial compensation. Therefore, $7 million that were given to the Kenyan government in 1999 went towards the rehabilitation of buildings. Ten years ago, the American government through the House of Congress came up with what we call USA Victims of Terrorism Compensation Fund. This was through the House of Congress, a legislation through the House of Congress in America. So only those who benefit from this fund are the 12 American citizens who were killed in the American embassy here. Contractors and employees of the American government. But no Kenyan has ever benefited from this fund. Those of us who had come to work, those who had just come of other, to do other errands, they have never been paid and we are all Kenyans. We are all human beings. Irrespective of being an American, either you are working in the American embassy, Oh, eh, they were. So that was discriminative. Several U.S. leaders have visited the bomb blast area, paid tribute to the fallen, and held meetings with victims of the blast, like Diana and Sidialo. Among them, Barack Obama, former U.S. president. He came first as senator for Illinois, and then later he was president. When Barack Obama came first. Him as a president in the U.S., having Kenyan roots, it gave us a lot of hope. And we thought him as a Kenyan, he as having Kenyan roots, he'll be able to identify himself with us. And also being a, a president there in the U.S., and we can identify himself with us, we thought he could fight for us. But when he went back, he kept quiet. So I found it that was quite unfair for him to come and they give us up. And yet he knew back, he was not to do anything. And even today, wherever he is, he can also be able to do something. 25 years after the bomb blast, the intersection has been rebuilt. The government built a memorial park to remember the past, the park was not named the Bomb Blast Park, as many called this place, but it was named the August 7th Peace Memorial Park. Inside the park is a site with names of all those who perished in the blast. And a museum with pictures and stories from the blast. The park gives us joy as we reflect just how far we've come in the fight against terrorism and violent extremism. The magnificence of the cooperative bank skyscraper that was rebuilt and now looks like nothing ever happened here is a great reminder of how important peace is to a society. The shared parking area has a humongous generator belonging to Coop Bank and a parking area that is used by the Memorial Park and Cooperative Bank. Where Ofun House used to be is the Memorial Peace Museum. My name is Anoxicolia and this is the Kenyan Historian. <laughs>